Hello, good morning. This is uh, class for week two, the second lecture, lecture one, corresponding to Wednesday, April the 8th, year 2020, for Botany and Plant Sciences 031, Spring Wildflowers. Last class, we finished with a discussion on how the transition between the Cretaceous and the tertiary periods that occurred approximately 65 million years ago opened the opportunity for the explosion of life forms so with a, a, of a, a plant life forms of uh, um, vegetation with, uh, with flowers, basically. And that was mostly due to a big transition brought up by the explosion of a comet in the Earth that left a, a, a layer in sedimentary rocks known as a KT layer, the Cretaceous to tertiary transition, and uh, that brought the extinction of all large lizards, the dinosaurs, and the appearance of the explosive appearance of a number of animal life forms that made uh, animal pollination from insects or uh, birds much more profitable to plants than the wind pollination. So we discussed that last class and we showed how uh, from uh, gymnosperm cones, from the cones of conifers, uh, a transition was made in which uh, the scales or bracts, as they are called, that form the cones um, evolved into showy structures that we know as petals and specialized structures for the production of male gametes. Uh, uh, gametes are the reproductive cells of uh, plants and animals. In the case of male gametes and plants is pollen grain. Pollen is the equivalent in plants to sperm in animals. And um, ovules in, uh, in the case of the female uh, structure of, of the flower. So basically, uh, let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation to the screen sharing and we'll discuss the structure of, uh, of uh, the plant flower. So the class today will be about the plant flower, what we call angiosperm flowers. Angiosperms are all plants that produce flowers, as opposed to gymnosperms that we'll see later, which are basically the conifers, plants that reproduce with non-showy cones that don't look like flowers, but are the, the evolutionary ancestors of modern flowers. Typically, a plant flower uh, shown in this uh, scheme has uh, four, four parts. The, it has the, the lower uh, world, four parts of worlds of bracts, if we can uh, call them bracts, remember, are highly transformed leaves. Uh, the lower world of plants uh, is, is formed by bracts that really look pretty much like a leaf. Uh, are green photosynthetic and they have a normally they have a, a, a central vein a midrib vein and they look pretty much like a leaf the second world of bracts is formed by also flat leaf-like structures but normally they're non-photosynthetic they don't do photosynthesis they're not green but they might have different colors red white um, yellow, uh, blue, purple, etc. Then there is a third world of parts that we call the stamens. The stamens have basically two parts. Uh, a structure on top that is known as the anther, which is uh, basically two sacs uh, that contain pollen and another structure known as the filament, which is basically a long, often quite thin thread 
that supports the anther. So the filament sort of brings the anther out into the air uh, so that any insect coming into the flower will hit the anther and get uh, the pollen that is being released by the anther. And uh, the anther itself is formed by two sacs that contain the pollen. And then it has this structure in the center that is known as a pistil. The word pistil comes uh, from the Latin pistillum, which means pestle. A uh, pestle, uh, you might recall what a pestle is. It's a structure made of normally of stone or wood that has a handle, in this case, this, uh, this long part here, and then a rounded part that you use in a mortar to grind grain or, or rocks or minerals or chemicals to grind different things. Because this structure is so similar to the pestle used in, in mortars, uh, the early botanists call it the pistil, which means, of course, pestle in Latin. The pistil is formed by three parts. First, a lower rounded part, which is like the bottle bite part structure of the, of the pistil. Uh, that is known as the ovary. The ovary has inside a series of little structures that are basically ovules. Uh, the ovules in plants are not formed by one single cell. They contain uh, the, the mother cell that will give the seed, but also surrounded by other cells that uh, protect it and evolve into the larger part of the seed. But basically inside the ovary inside contains the ovules. And then, like the anthers, it has a long structure that, in the case of the ovary, uh, is known as a style. Remember, in the anthers, it's, uh, it's um, very thin and it's known as a filament. In, uh, in the female part of the plant, it is known as a style. And then on top, it normally has a rounded structure, a globo structure that is quite sticky. It's normally very, very sticky and is known as a stigma. The role of the stigma is to harvest from insects coming in pollen grains. So basically an insect trying to get into the flower, normally the nectar is a glands producing nectar are down here. An insect trying to get into the flower will in all likelihood, who hit, hit the in all likelihood hit the stigma first, and if the insect is bringing pollen from another flower from another plant, leave part of the pollen there, and then as it goes down, as it walks down into the plant, hit the anthers and get pollen from this plant, then it gets its reward, which is a nectar, which is a sugary substance at the base of the flower, and off leaves the insect to visit another flower. So basically all flowers in, in the angiosperm uh, group of plants, in angiosperms, all angiosperm flowers have four worlds of parts, almost all. We'll see later a few exceptions, but, but this is a very, very uh, robust rule. Uh, the sepals, which are basically leaf-like green bracts that support and, 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 and subtain, maintain from below the flower. Uh, we'll see later they play basically a role in protecting the flower bud and making it non visible to potential predators. Once the sepals open, what you have is uh, a second world of parts that opens and displays, which is basically the petals. And the, the petals, uh, the role of the petals in the flower is basically to show off, to indicate to pollinators, I am here. This is a flower with nectar and attract the pollinators for pollination. These two parts, the sepals and the petals, are known as sterile parts. They don't actually produce uh, uh, reproductive um, cells. Uh, and their role is, in the case of the sepals, protection. In the case of the petals, attraction. And both of them are known as the perianth of the plant. So uh, petals plus sepals form the perianth. And then you have a third world of, of uh, bracts, highly transformed bracts, 
that, that are basically the stamens with the anthers and the filaments. And then a central structure, maybe one or maybe many, uh, that is basically the pistil or pistils in plural, if it's more than one, that has the ovules in the lower part of, uh, of, the, of the structure. The lower part is known as the ovary. It's a basically uh, a, a, a closed cell, a, recep a receptacle that contains uh, like an urn that contains the, the ovules inside. And then it has the style and the stigma. When the pollen hits the stigma, pretty much like sperm in animals, it will germinate the pollen grain in the stigma and start working its way down. Normally the style is highly nutritious for pollen grain. It, it, it has a large number of proteins and sugars. So the pollen grain uh, exudes um, a, a, an enzyme that dissolves its way down. And in doing so, it's feeding itself from the contents of the style until it can get into the ovary and reach an ovule. And then the pollen meets with the ovule, it fertilizes the ovule, and it starts the process of making a seed. This is very important. I know I've, I've dealt for quite a while on, on this figure, but, but this is the basic figure uh, that, that uh, represents the structure of almost every single flowering plant. They might differ once you start looking at them. For example, this is uh, the flower of the strawberry. And you can see it has multiple stamens. You can see all the stamens around. It has a central receptacle that is enlarged that will eventually give the quote unquote, the fruit of the strawberry, the, the, the red berry itself. And you can see the gynoecium uh, sorry, gynoecium is the name of all the female parts together in the same way that androecium is the name of all male parts together. In the case of the strawberry, it has many pistils. You can see all the pistils here, um, um, each one uh, sort of seeding in, uh, in the external part of the, of the receptacle. We'll talk about carpels later, uh, the meaning of the word carpel, but uh, uh, for the time being, assume carpal to be roughly the same uh, thing as a pistil. Uh, here we have a, a similar structure in, in, in another plant. You can see the pedicel of the flower, which is like the petiole of the leaf. It's a, 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 a short stem that, jump, that supports the flower attached to the larger growth stem. It has, you can see here, the sepals. You can see the petals that are sort of uh, uh, purple uh, to violet in this, in this plant. You can see a row of uh, stamens around the central pistil. It only has one single central pistil. Uh, you can see the style here. And you can see the stigma, which in this case, is fairly long in this plant. Some plants have only one sex. If the plant has both male and female functions in the flower, as in this plant here, we call the flower complete. So a complete flower uh, is basically a hermaphrodite flower. It's also called hermaphrodite. Uh, it has male and female functions. You can see this, this flower has a, has the sepals, then it has the pets, then it has uh, the anthers with the filaments. In this plant in particular, the filaments are bristled. They have little hairs coming out. We'll see this often in many uh, flower plants, in, in, in many plant flowers, sorry, and the role of these hairy structures is basically to scrub the insects off uh, uh, pollen on, on their way in so they can get new pollen on the way out. Uh, it has here the ovary, the style, and the, and the stigma. So this is a hermaphroditic plant and is known as complete. It's also known as perfect, a perfect flower. Now, there are many flowers that have only one sex. A typical example is the common squash. Uh, the squash plants have 
male and female plants. Uh, you can see them here uh, being cut. Uh, you can see the ovary that in this case is inferior, it's under the corolla. We'll talk about that later about inferior ovaries. And in the case of the male plants, you can see the corolla, which is the, the set of all petals uh, with, with the stamens inside, with, uh, with the um, uh, stamens lying inside. There's no female part. And in this case, the plant is female. It uh, has also a similar corolla from outside. They look uh, quite similar, although the female plant looks fatter below because it contains the ovary. And you can see the ovary here with the ovules that are being cut, and you can see the, the stigma and the style. So some flowers are unisexual. This is not common in the botanical world, but it's not entirely rare. You will see very often plants with only one sex. Um, and the most common case is plants with two sexes. Um, now, when plants have only one sex, uh, they, they might have the male and the female flowers in the same plot. So um, here you have um, a birch that has, um, uh, sorry, a beech, it's not a birch, a beech uh, that has um, uh, the genus Alnus is the genus of beech. Uh, they, they belong in the, in the family Fagaceae. Uh, and um, you can see here that it has uh, female catkins uh, catkins is an inflorescence, a group of very, very small flowers, but it has female flowers and male flowers in the same plant. Plants that have male and female flowers in the same plant are called monoecious. Uh, uh, mono meaning one, uh, issues coming from the same uh, word in Greek as oikos, meaning house, uh, as in ecology. Uh, monoecious means both sexes living in a single house. Dioecious uh, plants have uh, male plants and female plants. A whole plant will give entirely male flowers or entirely female flowers. And plants with that characteristic, with uh, uh, plants uh, that are the plant itself is not hermaphrodite, not only the flowers, but the plant itself is single sexed then you call those plants dioecious. It means that the sexes reside in different plants, in different houses, two houses. Um, and uh, a typical example uh, that is uh, important for California is the jojoba plant in, in the California drylands, deserts. And also you will see it on and off in the California chaparral. Jojobas, you have male plants or female plants. There are no hermaphroditic plants. Now we'll talk a little bit about the floral parts, how they insert on the, on the stem. Uh, normally, the, the, the typical uh, form of, of uh, insertion of plants is sepals uh, and then petals. Sepals, remember, form a structure. The set of all sepals forms a structure known as the calyx. Uh, the set of all petals forms a structure known as a corolla. Then you have uh, the stamens that all together form uh, a world known as uh, the androecium. And then you have one pistil or many pistils, depending on the plant. Um, and uh, the set of all pistils forms uh, the gynoecium. So this structure of sepals, petals, anthers, and uh, pistils is a typical structure in which the ovary is the topmost uh, structure of, uh, of the flower. The flower is along a stem and you have a whorl of bracts that forms the sepals, a second whorl of bracts that forms the petals, the corolla, a third whorl of bracts that forms uh, the stamens, and a fourth whorl of bracts that uh, forms the gynoecium, the pistil, or the pistils in plural. Now, in some plants, uh, for example, in the family Rosaceae, you will see that all this structure, the calyx, has become enlarged, has become quite enlarged. And so the ovary resides inside this sort of uh, 
cup-like uh, structure. And the, the, the rest of the sexual parts um, seem to be coming from around it. And when you have a flower with a structure like this, you call the flower perigenous. A peri meaning around, around uh, the, the, the gynoecium, around the female parts. The, the rest of the flower parts are inserted around the female parts. Remember in evolution, the case on the left, the hypogenous flower is the ancestral flower, is, is the way flowers wear initially, and it's the way you will see, for example, uh, very uh, primitive plant flowers like the magnolia has this, this structure. Most flowers do have this structure. Uh, Origenus occurs in some families, typically the rose family, the rosaceae. And then you might have plants in which the, uh, the growth of the calyx has become throughout evolution, throughout thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years, has become so large and so enlarged that it eventually devours the calyx. And so what you see is uh, a, a plant in which the rest of the structures, the sepals, the petals, and uh, the anthers seem to be above the, the, the ovary. When we have this, we, see, we say, that uh, the plants have inferior ovary, or also we call them the plants, the, the floral parts are epigenous. Epi above, uh, genus above, the female uh, part, above, above the ovary. So if the insertion is below the ovary, we call the ovary superior. If the insertion is around the ovary, we call the ovary also superior, but the flower is perigenous. And if the insertion is apparently on top of the ovary, then the ovary is called inferior and the flower is epigenous. This cup-like structure, when the ovary is perigenous, is known as a hypantium. So plants might develop a hypantium in order to basically uh, evolve a hypantium in order to protect the, the, the ovary. And then as the hypantium in, in evolutionary time, along long evolution has grown more and more, the ovary might be completely surrounded by the hypantium. And, and then the ovary, we call it inferior. Here you have the same diagram I took from, from a textbook. The other one was an illustration of mine. And you, you can see here the insertion of, a, of the flower parts. When the ovary is superior, the flower is hypogenous, there is no hypantium. There's just a calyx here with a receptacle. If the receptacle becomes enlarged, then the, there is a hypantium present and the flower is perigenous. And if the hypantium not only becomes enlarged, but becomes stuck, sort of adheres to uh, the, the ovary, then the ovary seems to be below the rest of the flower plants, parts, and we call the ovary inferior. You can see this very well in some of these of these flowers. Um, this, this is a, a, uh, a cabbage flower in which you can clearly see the flower parts inserted below the ovary, the stamens and the petals and the sepals, so the ovary is superior. This is a photo of an apple flower and you can see the very enlarged receptacle here forming a hypantium. But still the ovary is not uh, fused with the hypantium. It's still separated from the hypantium. So the ovary is still superior, but the flower is perigenous. If you look at the flower from outside, it will give you the impression that the male uh, parts and the petals and the sepals are some way around the, the ovary. And of course, if the hypantium has gone has fused completely with, uh, with the rest of the plant. This is a photograph of a fuchsia uh, that has inferior ovary. You can see here that the ovary appears to be below all the, all the, all the plant parts. Here you have the sepals, here you have the petals, here you have the stamens, and you can see that the style comes all the way down into an inferior ovary. In this case, 
the importance of, of uh, nectaries for pollination can be very, very well seen. You can, with some imagination, you can see nectaries here in the, in the, in the apple, uh, sorry, in the, um, uh, uh, in the peach plant. This is, uh, th this is a peach. I, I think I said apple, this is wrong. This is a peach. And you can see here the nectar glands in the future very, very well. Uh, attracting the insects with the long of the, of the um, hummingbirds with a long proboscis to get their reward while doing the service of pollination. So let us talk a little bit about the origin of all this. Uh, we know now how the plants are, but let us talk about the origin of, of, uh, of the angiosperm flower, what is known as morphogenesis. Uh, really Gymnosperm flowers, uh, the conifers, have flowers that have uh, uh, reproductive structures in cones. You can see this; these are the cones of a redwood tree, and you can see really well the gradual transition from the scale-like leaves of the redwood tree becoming uh, sort of uh, uh, flatter and, and wider until they form the scales or bracts of the cone. And these are um, male cones inside the cone. Uh, if you, once, once the cone is ripe, they will open and start releasing nectar. They are, sorry, you start uh, releasing pollen. There are, there are glands inside that, uh, that uh, sorry, there are cells inside that eventually become like the anthers in a plant, uh, pollen generating cells. Uh, this is, uh, we saw it last class, I'm going to repeat it now, uh, a magnolia flower. That if you see it, it's quite similar in more than one aspect to the cone. Magnolias are the most primitive flowers in the, in the angiosperm uh, group of plants. Uh, you can see that it has a series of bracts, pretty much like the ones here, they're basically flat and leaf-like, but in the magnolias they have lots of their chlorophyll and are sort of creamy colored. Uh, and, and they grow for a while. They have a, a normally one, two, three worlds of, of these uh, petal-like bracts. And then the bracts transition into these also still flat. They, they, they cannot deny their, their foliar, their leaf origin. These flat bracts that are uh, somewhat narrower uh, than, than the large petals and they have an anther on top. They have uh, pollen producing structure on top of each one of them. And then you have another world of bracts that are uh, also modified leaves uh, that are closed on themselves, and we'll see that later in more detail. And they have one single ovule inside. And they have a structure here. They don't have a, fit, uh, a, a style and a stigma clearly, but the suture, the joining of the, of the bract that, that supports the ovule is sticky and attractive, and that's where the pollen gets in. You can see it here very, very well in this, in this uh, photo. You can see uh, the sterile organs, uh, the petals, and then you can see the, um, the stamens that are still flat. They don't have a thin filament like, like in normal plants. I think most plants are still flat. And then here on top, they will start producing Poland, like uh, if you look at this structure here in the center, it doesn't look that different, does it, from the, from the redwood cone. And then you have yet another uh, series of uh, bracts that they're more difficult to see here, but they are like little leaves that are close on each other on, on themselves to form a little urn type structure that uh, contains a seed inside. And the tip of the leaf is sort of bended and the suture of that tip is sticky for pollen to, to stick in there and penetrate and fertilize the, the ovule. So we have a transition from, um, from um, conifer cones to flowers. And we can actually see that, that uh, conifer cones uh, could have very, very well gradually transitioned into becoming, the bracts becoming instead of woody and, and lignified, becoming uh, colorful and, and attractive and basically giving origin to the flowers. This is very interesting, very interestingly, this, this was not uh, understood initially 
by botanist, but by poet. Uh, this is uh, Goethe, uh, the great German writer and, and poet. And in one of his essays on nature, Goethe loved going out to the field and walking and uh, looking at, at, at uh, nature. And in one of his essays, he, he wrote, uh, we may well say that a stamen is a contracted petal or that a sepal is a contracted stem leaf. He really had an intuition for the idea that flower parts are really, uh, have evolved from, uh, from stem leaves that have uh, gradually acquired a specific function from bracts. This has been proven very, very well by uh, geneticists now doing molecular work and is known as the ABC system of genes. There are three genes that regulate uh, the formation of a flower. If the three genes are inactive, you get leaves forming along the stem. Then if gene A becomes active, the leaves like that form are smaller, uh, still green, and, uh, and, um, and they form a, a whorl of leaves that is known as a plant sepal. Then if the gene B becomes active and A remains active, then uh, you will have the formation of petals, petals formed when gene A and B are active. Then if gene A ceases to act and you get uh, the third gene C becoming active, then the next world of, of flower parts will be uh, the formation of stamens. And then finally, if B ceases to be active and only C remains active, then the next world of, of bracts, of leaves, uh, forms the carpels. So it has been shown very elegantly that it's really three genes that control the formation of a flower. Uh, now, flower parts can be fused or can be uh, separate. We use the word apple to indicate when the parts are free. For example, apple sepals means with free sepals. Apple carpus means free carpus. We use the prefix sin or sim when, uh, when the parts are fused. For example, sin petals means that the petals are fused. Sin carpus means that the pistil is formed by a number of fused carpels. And we'll talk later about, again, a strict definition of what carpels are. Uh, some, sometimes the parts of a plant, uh, the different worlds are fused. Um, uh, for example, um, no, sorry, uh, sometimes the same part are, are, are fused. So we call, when, when there is fusion of the same parts, we call it conation or conate. So conate petals is the same as being sim petals. It means the petals are fused. But sometimes different parts fuse. So uh, sometimes Petals and stamens fused, and uh, we we call them adnate. So we might have adnate petals and stamens being fused. I don't want to bother you too much with the uh, definitions of this. You have that in the in the lecture notes. Um, but at least it's important for you to know that they exist. They're a little bit nomenclature is always boring, and I don't want to make too much of of, of it. For example. Uh, this, this plant here, the, this flower here, has separated sepals, separated petals, and the pistils are formed, are all independent. It has many pistils all separated. And so this is aposepalus and apocarpus. Uh, if uh, this one here has, the pistils are separated, the same as above. And, and so the gynoecium is apocarpus. Now, sometimes the gynoecium is formed by the fusion of uh, previously independent pistils that fuse to form only one fused pistil, and then we call that type of gynoecium syncarpus. Um, let me talk a little bit now about 
perianth symmetry. This is, this is uh, really important and uh, we need to discuss this in some detail. So it has always drawn the attention of botanists that some flowers have all their flower parts, petals, sepals, um, stamens, and pistils, all radiating around a central axis. And flowers with that characteristic are known as actinomorphic. Actinos meaning stars uh, and morphic, of course, with a shape of. So with the shape of a star, also known as ra radial symmetry or regular symmetry. Uh, so plants are actin flowers are actinomorphic when the perianth may be divided into equal halves in three or more ways. And we'll show it. I know it's a it's a baffling definition, but we'll see it in a second in an illustration. Sigomorphic or bilateral symmetry, when the perianth has only one axis or one plane of uh, symmetry. Let me show you here. This is on the left an actinomorphic flower. You see, I could cut the flower in any direction. It has, uh, um, it has six petals, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it's, sorry, copied from Mitilica poppy. This is rare. Most plants have petals in five or six, but the illustration is copied from Mitilica poppy that often has six petals. But anyway, you can see here uh, that, uh, if I cut the flower in this direction, or I cut the flower in this direction, or I cut the flower in this direction, I will get exactly the same configuration on both sides of the flower. It has a number of axes of symmetry. It's like a star. Uh, well, this one here, uh, which uh, is uh, from a flower from a bignonia a family of uh, uh, well, trees and creeping plants, you can see that it only has one axis of symmetry here. If I cut it in this direction, the two sides will be the mirror image of each other. But if I cut it in this direction horizontally, the upper side will not be the mirror image of the lower side. It has bilateral symmetry. And this is interesting because we have bilateral symmetry, uh, humans. Uh, we have a central plane that goes from our head to our feet, and we have right, right and left. Uh, and uh, if you compare your right side to your left side morphologically, they're very, very similar. You have the same arms, you have the same legs, uh, that have the same size. A person is normally a human being, like any other mammal, as a matter of fact, we're very, very strongly symmetrical with only bilateral symmetry. We have bilateral symmetry. So the question that has baffled scientists for quite a while is why plants have, some have uh, radial symmetry, acti are actinomorphic flowers, and why do others have bilateral symmetry, sigomorphic flowers? You can see here uh, two examples, this of an actinomorphic uh, corolla, where you can cut the corolla in a number here, they, they put a number of different cuts, cuts and, uh, and you will get uh, the mirror image of a flower on both sides, right? If I cut it here through the vertical axis, you will get this pistol is mirrored by this pistol, this pistol is mirrored by this pistol, this anther is mirrored by this anther, etc., etc. But you can cut it in this direction and you will get the same. But this is an orchid, and uh, orchids have sigomorphic symmetry. Uh, they are bilateral. If you cut it in the, along the red line, it will, it will give two halves that are the mirror image of each other. But if you cut it along any other line, it won't give you uh, two parts that are the mirror image of each other. This is interesting. And uh, it has been a big question, why is this so? Well, the reason for this seems to be that life in the ocean, as a matter of fact, both the uh, photosynthetic uh, life in algae and animal life in, 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 uh, in um, things like uh, corals or anemones or um, uh, all sorts of, of uh, 
of organisms in water have radial symmetry. As a matter of fact, so much so that there's one whole sub-kingdom in the, within the kingdom Animalia that is called the radiata, which is organisms that have radial symmetry. 100% of the radiata live underwater. Uh, the organisms that made it out of water and colonized Earth, they're all bilateral. And it's another um, phylum in the classification of animals known as bilateria. Bilateral animals include insects, include reptiles, include amphibians, include birds, and of course, they include mammals. All animals on Earth are bilateral, while a lot of animals underwater, including algae, have radial symmetry. So plants evolved from algae, and uh, plants originally, if you look at a, at a gymnosperm cone, like a, a redwood cone, they have radial symmetry. Uh, and as flowers developed, uh, a conundrum uh, appeared for floral development, which is if a plant wants to attract insects, it needs to do so by being, uh, by having the same type of symmetry that the insect or the bird has, because insects navigate better in uh, things that have, in, in, in environments that have the same uh, symmetry that they have. Let me just uh, give you, uh, sorry, I, I, I missed that. Uh, one beautiful example of this is the Ophrys orchid. The Ophrys orchid, as a matter of fact, the flower resembles pretty much a female of uh, an insect that is common in Europe. Ophrys is a ground orchid in, in Europe. You can see this is the abdomen. These are the semi-open wings. This is the thorax. And here you have the head. And Ophrys not only resemble the females of a, of a, a group of insects, but they also exude the same pheromones. They, they exude female scent, so much so that uh, males will come and, and uh, attempt to copulate with, uh, with a flower, and in doing so, take uh, the nectar stack from one flower to the next, uh, pollinate flowers in doing so. So the attractant here, uh, Orphys, orchids are deceitful. Uh, they really cheat on insects, on male insects, and male insects are silly, like most male uh, organisms and most species. They, they allow themselves to be cheated by, by a false female um, uh, impersonated by an orchid. But you can see here very, very well how bilateral symmetry resembling the insect is extremely important. Many studies have been done by have been done by now, showing that in some insect groups and in some animal groups, uh, flowers with bilateral symmetry are more attractive, and hence gather uh, uh, an advantage in pollination. Let me just show you this example, which is somewhat silly if you want, but uh, this I took from uh, some. Uh, um, uh, visual game in, in, uh, in, the, in the internet and optical illusion. And, but basically what this shows is that any structure that is circular, uh, and in this case a uh, helicoid, will uh, give you a feeling of you are lost. You cannot bear your coordinates very well. This is not a welcoming structure. Just look at science fiction films or horror, horror movies, and very often they use tunnels or structures like that, where there's clearly no uh, right and left, up and, up and down, uh, to give you a sense of, of, of uh, being lost, uh, a sense of terrifying sense of being in a vacuum. As opposed to this very simple photograph, which is the entrance to a garden with a door, where uh, right and left, up and down, are very, very clear for us, like human beings, and this is uh, what you would regard as a place that attracts you, it's a calling place that, that you find attractive. Well, insects and other pollinators have exactly the same feeling. They, let me go back now, they might find this plant more attractive than this one. And this plant depends critically on some insects for its pollination, like orchids do, then perhaps developing a bilateral symmetry 
can be extremely important. So, in short, before we pass to, to the next subject, um, actinomorphic corollas, star-shaped corollas, are the ancestral trait, the ancestral form of, of flowers. The first flowers were actinomorphic, and they still are the majority of flowers. But there are a number of flowers in the, in the um, angiosperms that have sigomorphic corolla, have bilateral uh, corollas. And most of uh, flowers with bilateral configuration have very precise pollination systems, and they're attracting very often a very specific type of pollinator. So I will end uh, this, this class here. Uh, next class on Friday, we'll talk about corolla configurations, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, um, um, the androecium, the male parts of the flower, and the gynoecium, the female parts of the flower. Thank you. Thank you again so much for your uh, attention. And uh, please uh, also remember you can uh, read the same ideas, the same content in, uh, in the lecture notes. We have exactly the same in the lecture notes. And um, see you next Friday, Friday the 10th. We'll have the third uh, class of this week. Thank you very, very much.